In the Apostle Paul's final recorded epistle, he sent this message to his young protege, Timothy. He said, remember this, Jesus descended from David, risen from the dead. I like that phrase, remember this. Of all the things we've discussed, from church organization to morality to spirituality, if you forget everything else, don't forget this. And he highlights, remember this. Every so often, it's good for us as a church to just say, now, let's remember this. And that's what we're doing during this brief three-week series called Remember This. It seemed an appropriate time, and it seemed like I was the appropriate one to do it because this is my 25th year preaching at Oak Hill. So if we were to look back over a quarter of a century of sermons in our congregation, is there a theme? Is there a thread? And we found one. Remember this. God came. God cares. God's coming again. It's worthy of an epitaph, isn't it? Engrave that on your heart. Remember this. If you forget everything else, don't forget that. And so for three weeks, we're just focusing on the heart and the core. And may God bless this as the core message of our congregation. Revisiting some favorite passages and retelling some favorite stories could not help but return to the great chapter, Romans chapter 8. John Stott called the eighth chapter of Romans the greatest chapter in the Bible. And one reading will tell you why. If you brought your Bible open to Romans 8, we have outlines available for you. If you'd like to fill in some blanks or if your Bible is in your phone, just don't order pizza. Just <laughs> open it up. We'll say a prayer and get to work. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have granted us this opportunity. These people have entrusted me with their greatest resource, and that is their time May by your power I make good use of their time. And may you please forgive the sins of the one who speaks, for they are many. And help us to see Jesus and just Jesus. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Deanlin and I have three daughters. Each of our daughters was involved in Girl Scouts when they were young. And our youngest daughter, Sarah, especially took to being a brownie. Any brownies among a former brownie? I like to eat brownies. I was never a brownie. <laughs> I remember picking Sarah up from a brownie troop meeting when she was six years old. She bounded up into the car after the meeting. She was so proud of her just baked cookie. She had just finished a project. She showed it to me. She told me all about the meeting. And I started the car and off we drove. I turned on the music and she began to sing with the music. She was singing to God, singing about God. And I had one of those moments that parents have when you say, what is going on? My child is growing up. I mean, look at her. Her hair's all the way down to her shoulders. What happened to those chubby little fingers and that chubby little face? My, she's halfway to a dormitory. And so I reached over and I turned the music down and with one hand on the steering wheel, I placed my other hand on Sarah's shoulder and I looked across the car at her and she looked up at me and I said, Sarah, I want you to know something. You're something special. Someday some hairy legged boy is going to walk you off. <laughs> but as for now, you belong to me. And she looked out the window and then she looked back up at me and she cocked her head and she said, Dad, why are you acting so weird? <laughs> well, I, I can imagine those words did sound weird to the ears of a six-year-old. I mean, her brain couldn't comprehend the love of a parent. No six-year-old can. And none of us can comprehend the love that God has for us. 
but it sure doesn't keep him from speaking. Would you let God tell you he loves you today? Maybe that's what your heart needs more than anything else. It's just to hear the voice of God and to sense the presence of his hand on your shoulder as he says, you know what? You're something really special. I think the Apostle Paul was trying to convey to us the love of God when he crafted this masterpiece that we call Romans chapter 8. The first seven chapters of the book of Romans lead us up the mountain of redemption and grace. Not an easy climb, as you know, if you've studied those chapters. It's easy to get tangled up. But we finally reach the peak in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 9 through chapter 16 describe life on the mountain of grace. But having described grace and before he applies grace, the Apostle Paul wants us to celebrate grace. And so he crafts Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is marked by five questions, a quintet of queries that invite us to look out up from the mountain at this panoramic view of God's love. These are questions that are not new to you. You've asked them when you see the questions. You'll say, well, I've asked that question. What's new is not the question, but the answer. I invite you to fill in the blanks as we look at these questions. The first is the question of protection. And Paul asks in Romans eight thirty one, if God is for us, who can be against us? What a great question. He doesn't ask who can be against us. You could answer that question quickly, couldn't you? Who is against you? Maybe it seems that the economy is against you. Or your in-laws are against you. Or fate is against you. Or the odds are against you. Or your health is against you. Where the question simply, who is against us? Well, we could list our foes more quickly than we could fight them. No, but Paul's question is this. If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, his implication or his implied encouragement is God tips the scales. When God shows up, everything changes for the better because God is for us. I can remember growing up in the little town where I grew up, we would play football out on the street in the neighborhood. You ever do that? The kids would all gather and we'd play right out in the middle of the street and one team against the other team, but every so often one of our dads would come out and play. And you know, everything changed when a dad was in the huddle. The other team would tremble. But when you had a dad on your team, if he is for us, if he is with us, well, then we have an unfair advantage. Dear child of God, you have an unfair advantage over the devil because God is for you. God is for you. Paul says, if God is for us, God is for us. Four wonderful, powerful words. God is for us. Say them aloud with me, will you? God is for us. Say them again and emphasize a different word each time, starting with the first word. God is for us. God is for us. For us. God is for us. God is for us. Not just anyone, but God is for us. The one who runs the universe, who hung the stars and carved out the oceans, God is, not might be or used to be or could be or if I could just get my act together, would be. But he is for us. For in our corner, 
in the bleachers, calling out our names, standing on the other side of the finish line, rooting us to finish. If he had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a car, your name would be on the bumper sticker, Honor Student. If there's a tree in heaven, your name is engraved in the bark. God says, I have engraved their name on the palm of my hands. In the book of Isaiah, God asks, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion for the child she has born? Can you, mom? Can you? Can you forget the baby at your breast as you're feeding a child? Do you ever say, well, who is this child? I don't know who this child is. That doesn't happen. Can you forget the baby you have born? Didn't I once give birth to a child? That doesn't happen. But then God says, even if she could, I will not. I will not. God is with you. Knowing that God is in your huddle, knowing that God is on your side, that God stands in your corner, who can be against you? Death, debt, disease, not really. Even hell itself might set itself against you, but hell will fail because God is for you. That's the question of protection. Then he follows up with the question of provision. This is a great question. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Having seen what God did for us on Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, Will he not also sustain us on Monday? Having defeated our sin, detombed our grave, will he not also walk me through my shopping list, my traffic jams? Having established that he will care for my sin and my death, can't I turn over to him my concerns? about my life. Won't he graciously give us all things? This is Paul's question that defies us to be worry-free people. We don't have to worry. Do you ever worry? Some of us have postgraduate degrees in anxiety. We worry about everything. We worry about the IRS. We worry about the SAT. We worry about the FBI. (laughs) We worry about education, recreation, and constipation. (laughs) We worry that we won't have enough money. And then when we have money, we worry that we'll spend it too fast or we don't manage it well. We worry that the world is going to end before the parking meter expires. We worry that somebody is going to tell us someday that lettuce was fattening after all. (laughs) Did God save you so you would worry? Did he? Did he teach you to walk just so he could watch you fall? Would he be nailed to the cross for your sins and then disregard your fears? Come on. You think scripture is just teasing us when it reads, he has put his angels in charge of you to watch over you wherever you go. Question of provision. He will provide. So the question of protection is followed by the question of provision. And then two questions come in rapid succession. Two questions about guilt and grace occupy one paragraph. Who can accuse the people God has chosen? It's a good question. No one. Because God is the one who makes them right. Who can say God's people are guilty? Good question. No one, Paul answers. 
because Christ Jesus died. But he was raised from the dead and now he is on God's right side appealing to God for us. Some time ago I read a story of a youngster who was shooting rocks with a slingshot. He never could hit his target. As he returned to grandma's backyard, he spied her pet duck. And he let a rock fly and lo and behold, the stone hit and the duck was dead. The boy panicked and he hid grandma's pet duck in a wood pile only to look up and see his big sister watching the whole time. After lunch that day, Grandma told Big Sister to help with the dishes. Big Sister said, Johnny told me he wants to help in the kitchen today. <laughs> and she whispered to him, remember the duck. <laughs> what choice did he have? So for several weeks, he was at the kitchen sink more often than he was not. Finally, so weary of washing dishes, he decided that any punishment would be better than washing more dishes. So he confessed to Grandma that he killed the duck. I know, Johnny, she said. I was standing at the window. I saw the whole thing. But because I love you, I forgave you. I just wondered how long you were going to let big sister make a slave out of you. <laughs> He'd been pardoned. But he thought he was guilty. Why? Because he was listening to the voice of his accuser. Paul says, who can accuse the people God has chosen? We have an accuser. He is the devil. And he cannot take your salvation, but he can take your joy. He can take your confidence. He can take your power. He can take your peace. He can take your sleep. In every moment of your life, the accuser files charges against you. He has noticed every error. He's marked, marked each slip. If you neglect your priorities, he'll jot it down. If you abandon your promises, he will make a note. And he will remind you he lives to accuse you. The Bible calls the devil the accuser. He is the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuse them day and night before God. And we hear him in our conscience. We hear him accusing us. He's marching up and down before the judgment seat of God saying that Lakato is a jerk. That Lakato is lazy. That Lakato is a bum. That Lakato forgot to keep that promise. That, and he just lists them over and over and over. And as he speaks, we just hang our head and we say, I guess he's right. I'm just guilty, your honor. And Satan says, what is the sentence? And God, our judge, says the wages of sin is death. But in this case, the death has already occurred because this one died with Christ. And Satan has no response to that. Satan is suddenly silent and you are suddenly jubilant because you realize that Satan cannot accuse you. Oh, he can try, but his accusations glance off of you like arrows hitting a shield. No more dirty dishwater for you. No more penance. No more nagging voices. You have stood before the judge and the judge has declared you not guilty. And you can agree with Isaiah who said, the Lord God helps me so I will not be ashamed. I will be determined I know I will not be disgraced. He knows that I am innocent and he is close to me. So who can accuse me? If there is someone, let us go to court together because the judge is your father. The court is no place to fear. And once the judge has released you, you have no fear of shame. That's the question of guilt and the question of grace. But one question remains, and that is this. The question of endurance. Paul said, 
Can anything separate us from the love Christ has for us? There it is. That's what we want to know, isn't it? We want to know how long God's love will endure. Paul could have begun with this question. Does God really love us forever? Is there truly in this universe a source of unconditional love? All the rest of the love that we have known in our lives has been conditional. If you are pretty, I'll love you more. If you're successful, we'll love you more. If you're kind, I'll love you back. All the rest of the love that we have known has been conditioned upon our performance. Dare we believe that there is in the universe a source of unconditional love? Or can something separate us from our Heavenly Father? Can I slip too much? Can I misspeak too often? Can I raise too many questions? Can I fall too many times? Can I cross the line? That's the question. I believe with all of my heart that that's the question you have inside of your heart. And the longing that you have, dear friend, is to know that you are loved. That's really what you want. And that's what, that's what Paul is trying to tell us. He is trying to tell us that there is a love that is offered to you that is greater than any love you will find anywhere else. And you don't have to undress to get it. You don't have to get drunk to receive it. And you don't have to be rich to accept it. This is a love beyond you that does not depend on you. It just depends on God. You see, conditional love depends upon your performance. But God's unconditional love depends only upon the faithfulness of God who gives it. And to demonstrate how faithful he is and how committed he is, he lit the Bethlehem night with stars. And he filled the pasture sky with angels songs and he placed within the womb of that teenage Jewish girl the presence the very being of God in the flesh and God grew inside Mary until he had to come out and the word became flesh And Mary held Jesus and she did not know whether to give him milk or praise. Because he was at once human and divine. And Joseph looked at Jesus and did not know whether to call him father or son. Because at that moment he was both. Neither Mary nor Joseph said it as bluntly as my Sarah did, but don't you think their heads tilted and their minds wandered and they thought to themselves, what in the world are you doing, God? Or better phrase, God, what are you doing in the world? Can anything make me stop loving you, God asked. Watch me speak your language and sleep on your earth and feel your hurts. Behold the maker of sight and sound as he sneezes and coughs and blows his nose. You wonder if I understand how you feel. Then look into the dancing eyes of the kid in Nazareth. (laughs) That's God walking to school. Ponder the toddler at Mary's table. That's God spilling his milk. You wonder how long my love will last. Find your answer on a splendored cross on a craggy hill. That's me, you see, up there, your maker, your God. Nail stabbed and bleeding, covered in spit and sin soaked. And that's your sin I'm feeling. That's your death I'm dying. That's your resurrection I'm living. That's how much I love you. Can anything come between you and me? God asks. 
Hear the answer and stake your future on the triumphant words of the Apostle Paul. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor ruling spirits, nothing now, nothing in the future, no powers, nothing above us, nothing below us, nor anything else in the whole world will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, would you let your love right now fall upon your church? Would you, sweet Spirit of God, speak words of comfort to your bride? Would you, dear Father, find those whose hearts are so thirsty for divine affection, for kindness, Would you find that person who came today completely out of obligation, whose heart has grown hard, who really did not even care about being here? Would you now speak direct, just lift that person's chin up and look them in the face and say, I love you. Would you, dear Lord, place your pierced hand on our shoulders? And tell us that we are special, made in the image of God. And that we don't have to go looking for love in the wrong places because we found the right love in your presence. Let the love of Christ go deep into our hearts today. This is our prayer through Jesus Christ. And all who agreed with it said,
Thank you.